But Lily's not an automaton, <laughs> despite what she wants you to think. She's weak, fragile, flawed. Her arcane talents are subject to wild surges. She has to imbibe potions to augment her mental processes in order to learn spells. She's easily frustrated, distracted. She lacks the determination she imagines a mage should have. In fact, she's blatantly lazy sometimes. And yeah, she thinks wealth and position will grant her happiness. <laughs> she's far from perfect. In fact, she's usually too busy trying to keep up appearances. I trust that this current direction we are on will not continue. She's usually too busy trying to keep up appearances to notice she's slowly losing her soul. But I'll probably pick up uh, after we've spoken here with uh, Lady Gistev at the Gistev Estate. All right. Don't think. What is it? This is going to speak with the butler. Probably address uh, Lady Gistev herself. At least this time, she has her natural elven complexion. I think last time she was here, she was under that skin condition. Stand where you're at, peasant. Who might you be, and why are you in my estate? Make it quick. I have a tea to arrange. All right, bringing up the hidden. The hidden? But you were not one of the enlightened ones. All right, I guess probably making an appeal to her morality. Bringing up the little girl who was ill. It is forbidden to speak of him. So I guess it's, uh, the Hidden is not maybe an organization, but a person. There's a girl who was ill. I should not say anything. All right, again, trying to make it personal, bringing, raising her name, Jayella. I do not know where he is. Perhaps I can arrange a meeting. Oh, he shall be so angry. Listen then. Below the cursed hole of avarice called the Copper Coronet, there lies a maze of sewer shafts. Find the place if you can. The entrance lies within the tavern somewhere. Well, of course, we've already been there. All right. It's interesting. I shall ask the Hidden to meet you there, but I do not know where he will be or if he will show up at all. This is all that I can do. Go now, before you were seen here. Alright, so we have to return to the slums, enter the sewers beneath the copper coronet. What? Alright, so I'll continue the discussion. Lily and Emowyn. You have to imagine Lily as an isolated adolescent girl in the quiet and scholarly setting of the Candlekeep Monastery. One of her only friends is another girl, Imowen. They become friends, if not best of friends. And then, at some point, Lily's affections for Imowen begin to cross the boundaries of friendship. Maybe it started as some kind of infatuation, a crush on her best friend. Regardless, Lily can't confide in anyone, not even Imowen herself, for fear of breaking their friendship. As it becomes apparent, Imowen's love for Lily is platonic, not romantic. So, Lily's desire has become a secret that she has to repress. What should be a beautiful thing becomes a dark and ugly thing, and it poisons her heart, twists her soul. See, actually, there's a dark and perverse side of Lily that actually hasn't fully revealed itself yet. Eventually, as in when Lily grow to adulthood, the relationship takes on the facade of normalcy as Lily's outward signs of affection dwindle down to gifts which we've seen, such as jewelry or fine garments. Lily believes... You must gather your party before venture. Lily believes she will always love Imowen, and she cares for nobody more in the company. But, sadly, it's no longer love, unbeknownst to her. She simply learned to keep her tokens of affection to a level acceptable to her dear Imowen. In fact, those affections have mainly manifested themselves now into Lily's desire to nurture Imowen's development. Whether as an assistant, an, her aide, an attendant, an apprentice, or majoring, doesn't matter. Lily simply likes the idea that she is somehow helping Imowen blossom. But never, 
outside of her grasp. So, again, I was hoping that most of these things would have been conveyed in the subtext of the series, but just in case, I'm uh, mentioning it now explicitly. Then there's Jahira. Of course, uh, we don't know anything about Lily's mother, but uh, when Lily what leaves... What do you want? Daddy, daddy. Daddy. But when Lily leaves Candlekeep, her foster father, Garayan, advises her to seek out his peers, Jahira and Khalid. Of course, after he's slain, this pair becomes... Uh, what? Lily's parental figures, if practically. Even if it weren't for Lily's misandry, Khalid, despite being half-elven, is far too removed from the sagely Garayan, I think, for Lily to accept him. As any kind of paternal figure in her There's life. So many memories in such a place as this. Most unpleasant memories. In fact, I think she develops an outright disdain for him during the first series. But Jahira, in contrast, a half elven elder, strong in mind and body, easily fills that void left empty by Lily's missing and uh, unknown mother. Jahira's like a bear protecting her young. I think uh, her druidic neutrality also tends to offer sound advice and equitable negotiations on Lily's behalf. But eventually, Lily sees less and less usefulness, I think, in Jahira. But it is her yes? only family she has, so she refuses to let it go. All right. Nature's servant awaits. So, Jahira, approaching the hidden. What do you wish of me? Yeah, I don't think Jahira's gonna press about the secrecy. It's really about helping the girl. You were here to have me cure this girl, Jayella. That we are. It was not a question, fool. I do this because you have an aura of usefulness about you. Do a task for me. I shall heal the damage done to the girl's mind. Of course, we need to hear what the task might be. I'm being stalked by two creatures of evil intent. You will destroy these two for me, and you will do it well. Is that clear? I think we'll be tempted to... Uh, <laughs> Even take his life and see if he has the means to cure Jayella on him, but I don't think she's going to take that chance. I got a question about why they might be hunting him. But Jahira is worried about the guarantee. I said without question, try to wrap your mind around the concept and listen. <laughs> this chase has gone on too long and I grow bored. The two have a contact in the proprietor of a dingy flop house in the docks district called the Sea's Bounty. Contacting the proprietor, he's talking about the thumb. <laughs> Boy, these, uh... Surprised they're getting this runaround. Okay. He will not believe that you have found me without the code words. Tell him that you are a seeker. He will tell you where the two lie, waiting for word of my whereabouts. Betray me to them, and I assure you, both the girl and yourself shall die before I do. Go now and return when they are dead. Alright, so we need to go to... Speak with Tom Thumb. Tell him we're the Seeker. Find out where these other two are. Take care of them for the Hidden, and then return here. <laughs> okay. Alright, so, I guess... Con what is it? I guess, uh, continuing then with a discussion of the women of Boulder's Gate and <laughs> their relationship to Lily. Dinah here, of course, rescued from the Knoll Stronghold in the Cloud Peak Mountains. Of course, Lily's interest in Dinah here was professional, but she'd be lying if she didn't admit she was intrigued by the exotic but elegant invoker from faraway Rashomon. I think uh, Dinah here actually served as Lily's handmaiden, and she performed adequately, I think, until she died, of course, at the hands of John Arrhenicus here at the beginning of this series. You must gather your part. 
but I should probably explain the title of Handmaiden. Lily imagines herself the leader of a company. As such, she requires personal attendance. Arcane handmaidens, if you will. This is not necessarily a formal rank and title. This is more part of Lily's delusional vision of herself and her company. It could well be all just in her imagination. She expects her handmaidens to assist her by carrying and safeguarding her excess arcane implements like scrolls, potions, wands, robes. To aid her in the casting of mundane spells that she can't be must gather your that she can't be bothered to memorize. To avail themselves of her teachings and demonstrated I methods. Trust that this current direction we are on will not continue. To avail themselves of her teachings and demonstrated methods of the art. To resign themselves and be content as her malleable and meek magelings. And yeah, even in the perverse recesses of Lily's mind, to attend to her wanton desires. Of course, uh, <laughs> this is all in her imagination, you have to remember. Then, of course, there's Bronwyn. Of course, she was rescued at the Nashville Carnival from a state of petrification. Lily's interest in Bronwyn was strictly professional. She was impressed, I think, with her physical prowess and actually ignored the divine talent she had from Tempest. But uh, I think she actually served as Lily's captain occasionally and served with her all the way up to the battle with Saravok Anchov at the Temple of Bol. We haven't actually heard from her again. But I probably need to explain the title of captain, which, like Handmaiden, is not necessarily a formal rank and title. So I'll pick that up uh, after this. All right, so I think I await your need. Jahira telling the thumb that she's a seeker. It's a cold and dreary day when the thumb can't extend a bit of hospitality to his guests. Come, enter and be welcome <laughs> at the sea's bounty. So you found something, mate. These blokes would be interested in it. Go to the Five Flagons Tavern in the Bridge District in a room on the second floor. <laughs> Holy cow, this is quite the runaround. All right. Five Flagons, a room on the second floor. The blokes that want to hear what you can, tell them they are in there. All right. So, Nothing like some time ashore. What? All I need. I was talking about the title of captain, not necessarily a formal rank and title. Lily expects those that she considers her captains to take lead. Unless, of course, there's an unwitty male, I think, to serve in that dangerous position. She expects them to enter dangerous negotiations on her behalf, especially when she expects hostility or treachery. She expects her captains to defend the company especially her handmaidens, <laughs> and of course, to guard her person at all costs. Lily imagines them almost as her personal bodyguards, her personal champions, if you will, athletic, savage, even animalistic, in her private and depraved imagination. And then there's Faldorn. At the beginning, Jahira faced with the loss of her husband Khalid and weary from an extended foray with the company, took leave quite abruptly, uh, and it left a vacancy. Lily attempted to fill that vacancy with Faldorn, a shadow druid from Cloakwood. Lily's interest in Faldorn was strictly professional, but Faldorn was a poor surrogate for Jahira. She was not the elder, protector, or judge that Jahira was. Regardless, I think she did serve uh, adequately, at least till the final battle with Saravok Anchev at the Temple of Bol. And, of course, as we saw in this series, after Jahira rejoined with the company, Jahira proved to Lily that she was indeed better than Faldorn, emerging victorious from a druidic challenge against Faldorn. In Lily's mind, it was, a it was as if the old bear was still a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> I guess the question gather your party. I guess the question was though, for how long? And we have yet to see.